All right, uh, was Richard, I can't remember if Richard told me he did a great job or a fabulous job last week. Uh, uh, fabulous, okay, that's what it was. All right, I appreciate it, Richard. Thank you for, for uh, filling in. Um, so you got a treat last week, this week you get treatment. And so uh, that's, I'm back again. So we uh, arrived last night about 10 o'clock <laughs> at home, and um, we had a good trip, but uh, it's always good to be back. Um, any announcements we need to make before we get going? Nothing. Okay, let's pray. Father, thank you for hearing our prayers. Thank you for guiding us with your word. Thank you for loving us when we are unlovable. And uh, thank you for offering to us your new morning mercies. We are thankful for this class. We pray, Lord, that you will guide our thoughts today, open our eyes to see the wonderful things you have in store for us in your word, and we pray this through Jesus, amen. Okay, um, what we've seen so far about Moses, probably that stands out more than anything else, at least uh, if we're looking at it day by day and and, and looking at life as he looked at it, as it came to him, is that he appears to be a very reluctant leader. Uh, he, he's not excited about the opportunity. Um, you know, this was not an Isaiah moment where God says, uh, you know, who am I going to send? And, and Isaiah raises his hand, here am I, send me. That Moses, if anything, is here am I, send somebody else. Um, and uh, every time he seems to kind of jockey out of position or tries to get out of the position of doing what God was wanting him to do. And uh, what I've been trying to get us to think about, and I actually listened to, uh, to Richard's class as well and emphasized the same thing that we're seeing this as Moses sees it happen each day rather than jump ahead. Oh, well, we know what happens. He leads them out of Israel. They become this, that, and the other. Um, and so, <clears throat> how well did, uh, when Moses finally does go to Pharaoh the first time, how well did that go? It's back in chapter 5. Okay, didn't go very well. What happened in chapter 5, you remember? Huh? In, in what way? Chapter 5, verses 20 and 21. Okay, all right, so, I mean, he goes to Pharaoh with, okay, finally, we're going to do this thing, and he goes to Pharaoh and says, in essence, you know, God wants you to let the people go, go out of, out of Israel, I mean, out of Egypt, and uh, Pharaoh's accusation is, you guys got too much time on your hands, and it's been too, we're being too soft on you, so uh, we're going to increase your burden, make it that much worse, that much more difficult, so how did the Jews respond to Moses with that? Huh? <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, they're not thrilled about it either. I mean, it made him loathsome in their eyes. Uh, so it's a situation that, um, you know, if I'm Moses and I'm trying to think about this, I already didn't want to go. And I go, and Andrew, can you turn this down just a little bit? Uh, uh, so I don't want to go. I finally go. I appear to Pharaoh, and then it all backfires, and my first thought would be, see, it's what I told you. I mean, to God, this, is, uh, this isn't going to work out. You've got the wrong guy. So what happens in chapter 7? He goes to him a second time and appears to Pharaoh, and God gives him the ability to throw his staff down on the ground, and it becomes a serpent or a snake in front of uh, the Pharaoh. Uh, 
Is the Pharaoh just bedazzled by that and overwhelmed and knuckles under? No. Yeah, I mean, he has his magicians come forward and they, they throw down their staves and they become uh, serpents. So I didn't hear this last time. Maybe, he, maybe Richard asked this question. But uh, so how did that happen? How'd they do that? How were they able to do that? Okay, um, I mean, it's what we might say smoke and mirrors, you know, today, that this is a magical act. I mean, I've seen magicians make an entire plane disappear. Did it really disappear? No, it didn't disappear, but they sure made it look like it disappeared. Um, and so there's some kind of magical act that gets involved in this, some kind of uh, aspect. And so Pharaoh's heart is hardened by it. I mean, he's not softened and say, okay, I guess I'll have to go, let you go. So we're in chapter 7 this morning of the book of Exodus, and we're down to verse 14, and God has told Moses, Pharaoh is going to let you go. I mean, he's told him that. And so there is this series of plagues that are going to begin to afflict the Israelite people. I'm not going to read through all of these. It incorporates chapter 7 and verse 14 through chapter 12 and verse 30. I mean, it's, it seems like it's one thing after another thing after another thing. But it's not that God just decides to send 10 plagues on Pharaoh. What does he do? He sends the first plague and, and then does what? Gives Pharaoh the option to change his mind and, and let the people go. So Pharaoh doesn't. He sends a second plague on them. What, is, what does God do? Gives them another chance to change. Third plague, fourth plague, fifth plague, sixth plague, all the way through. Finally, the tenth plague is you don't want this to happen to you. And this is what's going to happen to you. If you do this, if, if you just still continue to stand firm in your resolve that you're not going to let the Israelites go. So what was the 10th plague? Yeah, death of the firstborn one of each family. Uh, I mean, this is overwhelming. This is, this is just something that uh, um, you would have thought these other things that led up to this would have been enough to break Pharaoh but it's not it wasn't okay turning a river to blood i'd be impressed okay i would be impressed if i saw that uh flies everywhere cattle dying thick darkness all of these different ones locusts devouring everything that finally you would think that pharaoh would say okay okay enough's enough enough but it takes the 10th plague the death of the firstborn before pharaoh finally lets them go wait right that's that that's exactly right they threw again through their deception their means their ways were able to perform something that looked similar that acted similar that seemed similar and so pharaoh in his heart gets harder and harder and harder it's not like he says whoa i better back off i mean it's like i'm not impressed i've got guys that can do that and so it doesn't do much for him mark Right. Right. Yeah, that's right. Taking, taking down their gods one by one by one in that sense. But of course, as they look at it, as the Egyptians look at it and their magicians do something similar, it's like, well, our God's as good as your God. I mean, that's kind of what their thought was. And so that's not going, we're not going to let you go. Now, remember, we got to think about this too. We're talking about a huge force of people, a huge force. I mean, this is their, this is their labor force. And what God is saying to do is, is let all of your labor force go and leave. And Pharaoh said, there's no way. I mean, not only will it break us financially, I mean, it's going to ruin the nation. It's going to, no, that's not going to happen. And so 
one thing after another thing after another thing after another thing comes upon the Egyptians. So ask this question in your, in your book there. Finally, okay, finally, do you think that Moses feels exonerated at this point after these plagues? What? No, okay, why not? Okay. Okay. Yeah, and I would I mean that certainly would weigh on him. I mean it's hard to see destruction of any kind. I mean for us to see destruction in that way, Richard. Yeah, I'm out after the 10th place. Okay, yeah, I mean, I would think there is at least a sense of I have been exonerated. I mean, that I've been telling you this is going to happen, and it has happened now. I mean, there's at least some sense of that, seeing the destruction and the weight that would weigh on him. So that leads really into the second question. Do you think that he's flying high now? And maybe that's more along the, the lines of, of Mary Lee's answer. He, so, certainly emotionally, this flying high I don't know that that would be where he's at because of all of this devastation and all this destruction do you think he's flying high or do you think he's just glad that it's over okay okay uh all right uh, what else do you think okay Right. Right. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I agree. I mean, like what Art's saying, I don't, I don't see him leading a cheer as they're going out. Finally, okay, we got all 10 of these plagues down and we showed you. Um, I, I can't see him flying high like that. Now, the aspect of maybe thinking, I don't have to go to Pharaoh again, that might have made him feel mighty good because he certainly was fearful about doing that before. Um, but, but all of these plagues have been, been just assaulted upon the... Egyptian people, one after another after another, because of their unwillingness, their unbending nature, and not giving in to God. So the Israelites finally do leave. We're in chapter 12 now of Exodus, verse 31. Exodus chapter 12, after these 10 plagues, um, oops, let's see, let me go back one page. Chapter 12 and verse, uh, yeah, 31. <clears throat> then he called for Moses and Aaron by night and said, Rise and go out from among the people, both you and the children of Israel, and go serve the Lord as you have said. Also take your flocks, your herds, as you have said, and be gone, and bless me also. And the Egyptians urged the people that they might send them out of the land in haste, for they said, We shall all be dead. 
So the people took their dough before it was leavened, having the kneading bowls around, uh, <clears throat> bound up in their clothes and upon their shoulders. And the children of Israel had done according to the word of Moses. And they had asked from the Egyptians articles of silver, articles of gold, and clothing. And the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they granted them what they requested. Thus they plundered the Egyptians." How are the Egyptians feeling about now as the Israelites are leaving? Please hurry and leave, okay? I mean, their fear is, I mean, it had been no, 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 all along. No, 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 you're not. And now they're begging them to leave. Get, you, here, you want some new, you know, some gold, some silver? You want some new clothes? You want whatever you want, just leave. Because what? Because we're all going to die if you stay here any longer. I mean, you see how this all ramps up, and now the death of the firstborn, so who's next? See, uh, we're going to fall under this. So please, leave, do as you, as you have intended to do. Um, so look at this question here. Even though we know what lies ahead, most of us do because of being Bible students, we know what lies ahead. He doesn't. And this tags back to what Art said a few minutes ago. I mean, he's got a responsibility on his shoulders. But if he did, if Moses knew what was in front of him, do you think he would actually leave? <laughs> what is in front of him? Okay. But you don't know that yet because you, uh, no. <laughs> so, so, but that's right. So, I mean, if, if he knew what was waiting for him? I mean, what is waiting for him is 40 years of wandering and leading the people throughout this Sinai Peninsula. 40 years. It's not like, whew, okay, we finally got that done. Now let's scat and get over here to Israel real quick and get this thing done. Maybe even thinking, then I can go back to Midian and where I can just take my flocks and, and work with Jethro, my father-in-law. I, I mean, I don't know what he's thinking. But uh, it'd be a tough call uh, if he knew what was ahead of him, all that he was going to go through. So this next question, on those times when we wish we, look, well, let me ask you this way. Do you ever wish you could see what was going to happen in the future? Yeah, I do too. There are a lot of times that I wish I knew. But on those times that we wish we could, do you think that God may be protecting us? Wow, I sure do. Absolutely. Um, if we knew the heartaches that were in the future for us, um, I, I don't know that we could continue. I don't know that we could face tomorrow. If we knew that we were going to pledge and get married, and I knew the heartache and pain and, and, and separation or division or hurt because I knew my spouse was going to do something to me. Do you think I'd choose this person to marry? Or maybe even choose not to marry? Or if I knew one of my children was going to get a horrible disease and they were going to face pain and difficulty and suffering, you think we'd go through with that? I mean, I think God blesses us by, by not letting us know what's going to happen tomorrow. I mean, if I knew the date of my death, whether it be tomorrow or 30 years in the future, whenever, however, if I knew the date of my death, if you knew the date of your death, how would you do leading up to that? I mean, you might try to get all your ducks in a row as far as spiritually is concerned, but how would you feel? Absolutely. You'd be eaten up with things. I've only got 36 hours left. See, I've only got 28 hours left. I mean, just imagine how that would be if you knew that's what was coming on. Mark? Right? But I don't know if it's going to be today or a couple of weeks from now. And so I can at least live today with the hopeful intent that it's not going to be. You know, if, it, if I knew it's coming tomorrow... Oh, oh, no, I don't want to go to bed, because if I go to bed, that means I'm going to wake up, it's going to be tomorrow, or whatever the case is. I just think God has blessed us by not letting us know. Moses doesn't know what's waiting for him. 
He knows he's finally been able to, through God's power, achieve this moment. And the Israelites are now leaving. They're exiting out of Israel. I would presume, and it is just a presumption, I presume that Moses thought they're going to do what they start out to do, and that is they march right up to the land. They're going to go in the land, right? I mean, that is what they do. They go right up to the land, and what happens? They're going to get turned back because of their own unbelief. But uh, in your life, when the way was much harder, uh, uh, have there been times in your life, let me ask it that way, when the way was much harder than you thought it would be? Richard? Richard? Mm-hmm. Right. Okay, yeah, that's a good thought because when God first tells Moses what he wants him to do, Moses balks, he's reluctant, he doesn't want to. But when he tells the Israelite people, what was their reaction at first? Finally, God is going to deliver us, okay? But they turned from that pretty quickly. Soon as it got harder, oh no, great, Moses, look what you've done to us now. And one thing after another, so you're right, there is a a, a time of preparation, and if we talk about mentoring, there is a time, the reason that you mentor somebody is you're standing beside them during that difficult time so that when it comes their turn, they're a little bit more able to stand and do as, as they should be doing. All right, so they get to leave, they get to go into the land, uh, or they get to, to, to leave the land, excuse me, and uh, turn with me to chapter 14 now. <clears throat> chapter 14 of the book of Exodus. Now the Lord spoke to Moses, verse 1, saying, Speak to the children of Israel that they, that they turn and can't be... <coughs> Before Pi Haroth, between Migdal, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> overworked my voice last week, <coughs> and the sea opposite Baal Zephon, and you shall camp <coughs> before it by the sea. For Pharaoh will save the children of Israel. They are bewildered by the land, and the wilderness was closed, has closed them in. Then I will harden Pharaoh's heart so that he will pursue them, and I will again honor, uh, uh, and I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all of his army, that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord, and they did so. Can can you hear Moses if if you heard this news? By the way, Pharaoh's going to be really mad that he lets you go, and he's going to start chasing you. So now you're Moses, and you're thinking, what? Will this ever end (laughs) okay I, i mean i thought we were done with this okay look what he goes on to say now it was told the king of egypt that the people had fled and the heart of pharaoh and his servants was turned against the people and they said why have we done this that we have let israel go from serving us So he made ready his chariot and took his people with him. Also he took 600 choice chariots and all the chariots of Egypt and the captains over every one of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and he pursued the children of Israel. And the children of Israel went out with boldness. So the Egyptians pursued them, all the horses and the chariots of Pharaoh. And it says, and his horsemen and his army overtook them, camping by the sea. So... uh, here is, uh, here is Moses and the people of Israel, you know, they're carrying the gold and the silver and the clothes that the Egyptians gave them. And all of a sudden the Egyptians are saying, what have we done? This was a stupid mistake. We shouldn't have let them go. In fact, look at what they've done to us or what their God has done to us. So they just, they turn and they start pursuing them and chasing them. And it looks like, in fact, we could have looked at it on the map, it looks like Israel doesn't know what they're doing. The most direct route to Israel was not the route that they took. 
And so God's leading them. And so all of a sudden, Egypt's, the Egyptians are hot on their tails now, pursuing after them. And when the Pharaoh drew near, verse 10, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So they were what? Frightened, afraid, terrified. And the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. And then they said to Moses, because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you so dealt with us to bring us out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we told you in Egypt, saying, leave us alone, that we can serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than we should die in the wilderness. So how did Israel, what did they think was going to happen? We're going to be slaughtered out here. It would have been so much better, Moses, if you'd have just done what we said in the beginning. Now, doesn't that sound very reminiscent of what Moses was thinking? God, when he goes to Pharaoh the first time, see God, isn't this what I told you? And, and this is exactly how the Egyptians are acting. Now, Edwin? Okay, well, um, I could... Right. Right. I could I could venture an answer, but let's throw that out for others because it actually is a question a little bit later um, in this. And Edwin's asking the question: How how could the Israelites be so frightened or think that Pharaoh is stronger than God in the face of all that they've already seen? How is that? How's that possible? Okay, they, all they see is a wall of water, or the water in front of them, okay, so, so, and the army behind them, okay, pursuing them, uh, that's somewhat. What else? <clears throat> because they have flesh and blood, <laughs> okay, that's the answer. Because we're all like that. We are all like that from time to time. And maybe we're all like that all the time. It depends on who we are. But <clears throat> Moses and Israel, they've seen miracle after miracle after miracle of God. And, and, and if they would have stopped and thought, uh-oh, wonder what God's going to do this time. That wasn't their thought. Their thought was, uh-oh, what are the Egyptians going to do this time as they're coming up behind them? And so they're fearful because they experience human life. It's like we all do. Mark? Are you suggesting that I, I don't? Is that what you were suggesting by that? Somebody who really knew what he was talking about. Go ahead. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, most people that I've dealt with do fear death even in the moment. Uh, I mean, at least that I've, and I've dealt with a lot of people as far as dying uh, is concerned, but uh, I, I think it's the imminence of this right in front of them. I mean, we're stuck. The, the water's in front of us. The Egyptians are pursuing us. It's over. I mean, we, yeah, God did some great things, but I mean, what do we, what, what's going to happen now? I mean, it just looks to be overwhelming. It's not going to go, get any better than this. Um, but I think more than anything else, they're like us. We all have short memories. We have painfully short memories when it comes to God and His blessings and service for us. God takes care of us and provides for us, and the next obstacle or challenge comes in our life, and what do we do? Oh, no, I, what are we going to do? Where's God at now? I mean, we tend to react in the moment, and I don't think that they're any different than us. 
They've seen all of these things. Have you seen the power and the work of God in your life? I have seen it in my life. And yet, here's another obstacle. And oh, no, what am I going to, how is this going to, I mean, we just, we're stuck in the moment. And our flesh and blood takes over, I think, so oftentimes. So, anyway, they, they, the Egyptian army is pursuing them. The Red Sea is in front of them, but God opens up the Red Sea. They, they cross over on dry land. And again, we need to picture, and that's so hard for us to do, we're talking a couple million people who are crossing over. God didn't just split it open and there's a, you know, we've got an aisle like right here down between the pews and everybody just single file went through and and they got over to the other side well and it's not like when we sometimes use the the phrase the children of israel had a little child one time ask and said how they get their big wheels across so um you just think about that for a little bit okay so i, I mean the, the idea was how do they do this well god opened up a a vast enough area for them to cross over that two or three million people are crossing over the Red Sea to get to the other side. Two or three million people. Now, making it over to the Sinai Peninsula. Okay, so they get on the other side, chapter 15, and there is Moses writes a song of praise, giving praise and glory to God. So why are they so happy? They didn't drown, and the Egyptians did drown, okay? Yes, finally it looks like it's over now. Finally it looks like we're on our way, okay? And, and we're, we're going to really get there after all. And so in chapter 15, verses 22 through 24, after this beautiful song of praise, it says in verse 22, So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, then they went out into the wilderness of Shur, and when they went three days into the wilderness and found no water. Now, when they found no water, uh, excuse me, now when they came to Mara, they could not drink the waters of Mara, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Mara. And the people complained against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? Okay. Uh, now, why would they complain? Because they are thirsty. I mean, that's a real thing, all right? These are real people who have gone three days journey into the wilderness and they're thirsty. They are what we might say literally dying of thirst. It's not just like, ah, you're like a, you know, a, a cold Coke. I mean, they're dying of thirst out here. Three days journey and now we're, we're oh, finally we found some water. Oh, we can't drink this water. What are we going to do now? It's the same situation. So God delivers chapter 15 verses 25 to 27. So the fourth obstacle now we're hungry. I mean, how big a deal is hunger? How many meals do you skip a week? Okay, I mean, hunger's a big deal. So they're truly hungry. So God delivers them. Obstacle number five, we're thirsty again. You ever got thirsty a second time? Sure you did. So in chapter 17, they're thirsty. After seeing all that God's done, how could they gripe and complain? This was Edwin's question. How could they do it? It's because they are part of the human experience. Okay? I remember one time I was talking to Dr. Oliver. I said, he said, well, I think you might wanna, we might want to consider you taking this medication. I said, ah, I said, David, I really, I hate taking medication. Okay? I just hate taking medication. He said, well, welcome to the human experience. I said, well, that's not helping me at all. This is what it is, he's saying. And this is what's going on here. These people are facing human experience day by day by day. And Moses is trying to lead them. Moses, who didn't want to lead them to begin with, he's dealing with one obstacle after another obstacle after another obstacle. So I asked this question, in what ways are we often the same as them? Are you? You gripe and complain ever? Okay. All right. Um, you know, we gladly open our hands and accept God's gifts, and then when we don't get exactly what we want, we put our hands on our hips and begin to complain. Dane? Okay.
right? 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 Yep. Right? Absolutely. And, and, and the other aspect of this that's so amazing is that God has preserved it for us so that we can do exactly that. Look at that and say, oh, wow, I guess, I guess I'm acting like the Egyptians here. I guess I'm acting like the Israelites here. And may, maybe I can learn the message that God has in store for me. But God delivers them again and brings water to them. And then there's the sixth obstacle, the Amalekites in chapter 17, and dropping down to verse 8, now Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. So, I mean, they haven't even gotten there yet, and they're having to fight battles. Um, This cannot be easy. It cannot be easy for any of them. God delivers them. And uh, they're able to make it through, but still, it is one challenge after another challenge after another challenge after another challenge. And what I want us to see from this, and and, uh, looking at the last part of this lesson, lesson number four, mentors, and we're talking about mentors and mentee relationship here, mentors show their support. So who is the mentor here, and who is the mentee? Who's the mentor? Okay, the mentor is God in this, and who's the mentee? It's Moses, and really all of Israel in one sense, okay? But God is working with Moses, trying to get him to be the man that he needs to be. So how does God show his support to Moses? If God is the mentor showing support, how did he do it? Okay, had a solution for him each time. What else? Huh? Talks to him, okay, works with him. I mean, he, God is side by side with Moses. It would have been easy for, for Moses to say, I, I mean, to think, I'm in this alone. But God says, no, you're not, because I'm right here beside you every step of the way. And working with him and helping him and directing him and showing him and supporting him in that. Did Moses need the support? Yeah. Why? Look at the first line under mentee. Mentees face challenges. Okay? Have you ever taken on a new job and you had a mentor who was trying to show you along? And I mean, you're just Mr. Fumble Fingers. You don't know what you're doing because you haven't done this before. And they're saying, no, no, here, you take this, you do this, you add this, you add whatever. And it's like, okay, let me watch you do this a few times so that I can do it when it's my turn, right? I mean, that's kind of the idea. So the mentor shows his support when you mess up and the mentor says, no, 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 here, do it this way. Try, try this next time, okay? And shows his support, gives you the encouragement. And uh, uh, mentees face challenge, but mentors don't give up. I mean, did God have opportunities to give up on Moses? Man, oh man, over and over and over again. And when Moses keeps saying, in essence, before this, I'm not the guy, I'm not the guy, I'm not the guy, look for somebody else, I can't speak, find somebody else to do this, um, how about this, how about that, how about that, and finally when God answers all of those, and finally he says, okay, fine, but anybody but me. <laughs> I mean, it, it's obvious Moses does not want to do this, but the mentor shows support, he doesn't give up on them, and uh, uh, I think that's, to me, this beautiful picture of this. All right, Mark. Right. 
I agree. Yeah, it's a watershed moment, it seems, for Moses because, I mean, he realizes these are dire circumstances, but let's wait and see what God's going to do. Stand by, watch, and we'll see the power and the working of God. Um, and what we sometimes do is we work with somebody and we encourage somebody. But you know it gets tiring to work with people when you feel like, especially if you're the person who's dealing with a reluctant person, as Moses was earlier, it, it's sometimes easier to just say, okay, you know, I'm done with this. Forget it. I'm wasting my time. I mean, God could have thought in those ways, I guess. And I wonder if he looks at me sometimes and thinks that, okay, I'm, I'm tired of dealing with him. But, but mentors show support because mentees face challenges. And they don't give up because mentees oftentimes feel overwhelmed. I mean, this seems too big of a job, too much you're asking of me. And that happens in the church. It happens on a work situation. It happens in different, uh, different realms of life. So uh, let's see, I thought I saw, uh, Diane, was it your hand? Uh, go ahead. Right. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's right. And so it is this stair-stepping kind of thing that goes on, and that's a very good point in this mentoring kind of relationship that it's going to actually open up when he specifically takes Joshua under his wing and begins to mentor Joshua later on. Um, but we face these kind of challenges, we face these kind of difficulties in life, and how helpful it is, how beneficial it is when you have somebody to come alongside and say, let me help you out. Let me walk alongside of you. Let me show you what you can do and then give you the encouragement and continue to bolster you. I believe in you. I think you can do this. I, I, I believe you've got the talent or the abilities, whatever it is, to get this done. When the mentee feels like he's just kind of swimming in this ocean of I'm not sure and I'm not, I don't know what and how and so on and so forth. Uh, so anybody in here have a... Uh, did anybody in here have a spiritual mentor who did that for them, walked alongside them and helped you out? Anybody? Art? Okay. Okay. Okay, all right. Uh, so sometimes it's a godly grandparent or parent. It could be a friend or somebody, somebody else. No, okay. Well, well, there you go. If nobody else had a mentor in here, all of you need to be a mentor for somebody because you can see that's where we're building to, right? That's kind of the idea of this. Uh, okay, so we're going to stop now and uh, we'll leave you at that. We'll be on lesson number five next week. And I appreciate your good thoughts. Give some, some thought and reading to the lesson ahead, and, uh, and we'll go from there.